Hello there. Welcome to today's presentation by the Canadian Association from the Club of Rome, uh, entitled The he Climate Crisis is a Health Crisis. Uh, my name is Gord Kubinek. I'm on the board of KCOR, and I will be your host today, introducing and fielding questions. A um, little bit of background about Rob, and uh, part of this uh, little story is about how the world is a small place. And uh, beware of... Uh, doing of small actions and the repercussions. It turns out that Rob reminded me today uh, that we met hiking in Gatineau Park several years ago. Uh, we had both belonged to a Christian environmental organization. And uh, that's one degree of connection. The other one, it turns out that he, of course, is a registered nurse and he knows my wife from the nursing circle. So wherever you are in the world, uh, it's a small world. And we all have these uh, wonderful connections with each other, and hopefully today we'll increase those connections among people. Um, Rob is a registered nurse working in a community setting right now. He's also done a, has a degree in biomedical and mechanical engineering. Um, today he's going to focus on the climate crisis, and I think what was very uh, gave him some uh, horsepower to do this is. He was the Ontario Nurses uh, Representative for RNAO, which is the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and he represented that organization at COP28 in Dubai. Um, what we're going to learn about today is how the uh, idea that the climate crisis is out there and is affecting polar bears is basically now affecting us. And this is now getting very, very personal. And now I'm looking forward to that. Uh, be aware when you have a question, a reminder, type it in the chat box and I will keep track of the order and who in there and I will be fielding that after 45 minutes. So we're gonna have around 45 minutes um, with Rob and then around 45 minutes of questions uh, and answer. So without further ado, Rob, uh, welcome. And we were lo really looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Gordon, for having me. So my presentation today is entitled, uh, it's titled, The Climate Crisis is a Health Crisis. According to the WHO, uh, climate change is the biggest health threat facing humanity today. So environmental issues, well, the root cause of all systemic environmental issues are often related to power and wealth imbalances. We often talk about uh, social determinants of health in nursing and health circles, um, and they have large impacts on human health outcomes. So the powerful and wealthy want to increase or at least maintain their wealth and or lifestyle. And it's usually done at the expense or exploitation of poorer, less powerful, often racialized or other marginalized people. Some com common buzzwords in these circles right now are environmental racism, environmental justice, climate justice, etc. So society runs on energy. We think that society runs around uh, money, but at its root, money is whoever has energy. So we will run on it biologically as people and human beings, um, but we also run on it economically. Money is only an abstract quantification of that wealth. But whoever has control over energy and resources, they have the power. Now, this could get into a lot of controversy, I'm sure. But some people, the fall of the Roman Empire, some possible causes have been postulated are lead poisoning in the pipes, dishes, and makeup. So those are environmental toxins. Some other ideas have been loss of trees from deforestation, which potentially increased mosquito-borne disease such as malaria, unsustainable farming practices, and also wood was one of the primary sources of energy. And if you don't have any more of it or not enough, it becomes a scarcity issue. Fast forward several centuries, we have the rise of the European colonial powers. Before, about 500 years ago or so, Europe was pretty much equal with all the other countries around the world. Again, you could debate that, but we're not going to. Um, but they started 
growing in power compared to other people because they started exploiting other people and energy sources. So one of the ways they did that was with the transatlantic slave trade. And it became this triangle where um, people were stolen from Africa, brought over to the Western world. Um, and then they were do forced into labor and raw materials from that forced labor was sent to Europe and went into manufacturing. And they often used the same ships and it was this triangle. However, global economic system change is possible. That we don't have that slave triangle anymore, that transatlantic slave triangle. It took about a half century of abolition work, but abolition happened in the British Empire in 1833. And then uh, 30 years later, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation happened in the United States. And that kind of, well, the Civil War happened around the same time. That's not to say, though, that slavery doesn't still exist. It still exists, but it's in a very different form. And it's much more at the periphery of our Western society. Things like human trafficking, forced prostitution, forced marriages, child uh, marriage, domestic servitude. Variations on it still exist in other places around the world um, as well. There's the Asian textile industry. There's construction industry in some other countries as well. But... For all intents and purposes, the European version of it, it shifted. Now, here's an interesting idea to think about. Did abolition end slavery or did the Industrial Revolution fueled by fossil fuels end it? Was one type of fuel replaced with another? So one type form of energy exploitation. So the British Industrial Revolution fueled by coal was between 1760 and 1840, around the same time as abolition. Oil takes off in the late 1800s in the United States with Standard Oil Trust starting in 1882. Same kind of, same area of time. Talking about coal, we have Svante Arrhenius and many of the engineers and scientists in the room have probably come across this guy before. In 1896, he was the first one to predict that the doubling of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will lead to a temperature rise of about five degrees Celsius. So that is over a century ago. We think of climate change as this thing that is relatively new in the last few decades. It's gotten worse in the last few decades, but the idea has been around for much longer than that. Everybody in this group probably has heard of the greenhouse effect and knows how it works. Solar energy comes in, gets stuck in the atmosphere. Some gets uh, radiated out, whereas the other gets stuck. In. Um, that atmosphere gets uh, becomes traps more of that by greenhouse gases. Kyoto Protocol laid out seven of the most potent ones. And we notice that the temperature is increasing. So on the left, we have uh, average yearly global surface temperature increasing and relative to carbon dioxide. And everybody I'm sure is familiar with that graph. Over time, we should actually be getting colder. We're not, we're getting warmer. So there's a problem, we all know it's there. Not everybody accepts it, but we all know it's there. People have known about it as well, not just Fonte Arrhenius. There was uh, White House science advisors brought up a memo to President Johnson in 1965 saying that this was an issue, but they thought it was going to be over a long period of time, not as fast as it's happening now. Oil companies knew about it. And but they didn't really publicize it. They kind of kept it under wraps because it was an existential crisis for them. We have this real big political polarization that happens in our world right now. And that wasn't always the case. There used to be bipartisan uh, support for environmental protection agreements. So we had the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909, Smelter, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, 78, uh, dealing with acid rain in the 70s and 80s, 
the Montreal Protocol for ozone. Um, people used to cooperate because they saw that it was a problem and they dealt with it. Why did we stop dealing with it? The 18, 1980s and 1990s came and it started to take a larger role. People started waking up to it. It was called global warming at the time. It still is. But this is a direct threat to the oil companies and they knew it. So when there's a direct threat against you, what are you going to do? Well, they took a, a page from the big tobacco playbook and they started putting misinformation out there, misinformation to try to sway how people were thinking. And there's a whole bunch of climate denial that started happening, the, all these great debates. We wasted three decades debating climate change rather than acting. We should have been acting in the 1990s and we weren't. We were wasting time fighting over whether or not it was real. We knew it was real. We've known it was real for a long time, but the oil companies were putting all this money into this, just like the tobacco companies did. Now, why does this matter to me as a nurse? Well, we stop, tobacco causes a lot of problems, it causes a lot of different cancers, a lot of other issues, and it is a public health issue. And doctors and nurses, we put an end to a lot of the uh, advertising and misinformation. So in the 19, 1988, there was a the, um, piece of legislation that went through that stopped tobacco advertising after years of advocacy work from the health industry, from the health sector. And smoking rates in the 1950s were about 50% or higher, and now they're around 10%. So this is a really interesting thing that we can use to potentially deal with climate change. Misinformation, it works. Anybody who has been in Ottawa and has noticed it, they've noticed the green Canada action signs on bus stops. Alberta has put misinformation out there with advertising. Misinformation, it sows the seeds of doubt. Again, I, as I said, it started in the 1990s. Um, and they've changed it from a bipartisan issue where we work together to fix a real existential threat to this political debate. Oh, there's the higher cost of living from the carbon tax, or oh, there's job losses, just transition. And we fight over these stupid things instead of actually dealing with the issue. And these campaigns, they are very well funded by the oil industry. And going back to what I was saying at the beginning, they have power and they don't want to lose it. This is what they're doing to hold on to that power, hold on to their control over the energy and control over their wealth. Now, here's a climate justice. The richest 10% in the world are responsible for about half of all global em greenhouse gas emissions, whereas the poorest 50% are responsible for about 10%. That's not fair. That's not just. However, the poorest people in the world, they can't do much about it when a climate disaster hits them. Whereas the rich people in the world, which most Canadians fall into that, probably most people on, that, on this phone call into this, or the Zoom meeting, we can afford air conditioning. We have enough income to pay for higher food prices. There are problems in Canada around that right now, but that's not everybody. We can afford to relocate if they're where they're living, where we're living becomes inhospitable. And then there's things like controlling rights to water. Places like Dubai, Las Vegas, they're built in deserts. Deserts have no water. And yet there are these big fountains and pools and other stuff. Money, with money, you can design and engineer solutions to uh, protect yourself and pad yourself from things. However, it causes much larger impacts doing that. So how does climate change affect health? Well, it affects, vulner there's vulnerability issues. So this is a WHO, World Health Organization, infographic that I really, really like. It talks about vulnerability issues, exposure pathways, health system capacity and resilience. And then it breaks down 
different ways that climate change can actually affect health. Vulnerability pathways, demographics, geographics, biological factors, sociopolitical, socioeconomic. So young, very young, very old, they're more susceptible to a lot of diseases and a lot of climate related issues. If you're somewhere that is facing uh, water scarcity, you have these geographic factors. Some people can't tolerate heat as well. Those are biological factors. Socio-political factors, maybe they're part of the wrong group. Maybe they're on the wrong side of the tracks. They can't handle, they can't, uh, they can't buffer themselves as much as other people. Exposure pathways. So people who work outside, exposed to more extreme weather events, heat stress, air quality. Well, in Ottawa, most people were affected by poor air quality last year, but some people, a lot of them can work more inside. Not everybody can work inside. Not everybody has even has a, a roof over their head. Maybe they're outside a lot more often. Water quality, quantity, it goes on. And then we have health system capacity and resilience. Do our leadership structures and governance protocols are place to be adaptable to climate change? Next point there, health workforce. Before COVID, our healthcare workforce was compromised. COVID, it really messed it up. I was working in a emergency room in summer of 2022, and there was a 50% vacancy rating for the nursing staff there. If you're at 50% capacity, how can you surge during a time of a climate of a uh, of a climate related event? You can't. Health systems information; these things can go be challenging. Um, availability of essential medical products and technologies. This was a big thing during COVID, where people didn't have access to PPE or personal protective equipment because we put a lot of these things offshore. We don't make a lot of the stuff anymore. Our pharmaceutical industry in Canada is fairly small. We, if there's a scarcity of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, and drugs, and we might not have access to them. Service delivery and then financing for all of these things. So injury and mortality, this is, could be the trauma, the physical trauma from the actual event. So uh, during the derecho in um 2022 this was in ottawa it was a giant windstorm that just blew through ottawa and much of ontario we were actually going biking as a family there's they thought it was a uh, a thunderstorm coming through we got 10 minutes of warning and we took shelter under the westboro uh beach bike uh westboro beach there's a little bridge and we took shelter under there but a boater died on the ottawa river um, when the wind overturned, overturned the boat, who were hit by falling trees. There are 1 million people without power. Hydro lines are down. That's a major hazard. And trees were down everywhere. People couldn't get around. Access to emergency services was limited. Then we look at the wildfires in 2023. Four wildfire fighter, four fi uh, firefighters actually died. The uh, wildfire in Maui, 90, 97 people died. They were either burned alive in their car trying to escape or they were swept out to sea. Wildlife impacts as well. A lot of species are severely impacted. There, were, When there were bushfires in Australia, the koala population took a huge hit. We don't even know what the, well, maybe somebody does. We don't know what the wildlife impacts were of our northern fires this year, but there's got to have been some. Hurricanes. Uh, and then there was a major uh, wind, uh, major storm in spring or summer 2023. There were people in Atlanta, Canada, who were actually swept out to sea and died. And then there's an interesting case about Libya in 2023. Massive rains broke two unmaintained dams. About 20,000 people are were either died or unaccounted for. Why are they unmaintained? Well, there's civil unrest and anarchy that followed the Arab Spring of 2011. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but some of that was due to drought, crazy drought that had been uh, like the worst in centuries, and it fueled some of the unrest. 
heat related illnesses. So our ideal temperature for external temperature, we want room temperature, 21 to 25 degrees Celsius. Harder than that, we're sweating. Crazy harder than that, we're starting to have uh, issues where we're not compatible with life anymore. When the body temperature goes over 40 degrees, proteins in our body are starting to denature, homeostasis is off, and organ failure can start to happen. When the wet bulb temperature is above 35 degrees Celsius, we're unable to sweat to cool down and that's incompatible with life. In 2021, the BC heat dome killed 595 people. 99% of them were killed in their homes, 70% over 70 years of age. They didn't, a lot of people didn't have access to air conditioning. That is a major factor for that. Even my patients in Ottawa, I go to a lot of um, lower income patients or people who are on Ontario disability or other things like that. They don't have access to air conditioning. They're stuck in an apartment building. It's cement all around them. And if they're facing the wrong way, it can turn into this giant greenhouse in their apartment. They're at really high risk of uh, heat related injury. This is getting worse. 2023, as everybody on this call know, probably knows, was the hottest year on record globally. Respiratory illnesses. The really, really small particulate matter, less than 2.5 microns, it can enter our bloodstream through our lungs, increases asthma, COPD exasperations, and can lead to abnormal clotting, which can cause heart attacks and strokes. 2023, it was our worst wildfire season on record. Two thirds of the Northwest Territories, including all the major towns and cities, parts of BC, even places in uh, Northern Quebec and Ontario, Alberta, Saskatchewan, a lot of these places were evacuated. There's a lot of marginalized communities in those areas, a lot of indigenous populations there that are already facing a lot of hardship. That puts even more strain. This is a forced internal displacement this requires infrastructure, financing, and coordination for evacuations. This is implication on their mental health, access to shelter, food, essential medications. You have diabetes and you're out of town. How do you get more diabetes medication? You run out of insulin. That's really bad. Or say you need dialysis because uh, you're in renal failure. Where are you going to get dialysis when you're evacuated? That means the receiving community has to be able to absorb it which means the receiving community has to be working below capacity to be able to absorb that. Otherwise, they're going to be in surge mode. And already, a lot of healthcare in Canada is in surge mode. About one in five deaths globally are due to fossil fuel uh, emissions, burning of fossil fuels. Approximately 10 million fatalities are due to fo uh, fossil fuel air pollution alone. November 1st, 2023, around 7 million deaths due to COVID, that's already less than uh, 10 million deaths per year. So COVID was less than uh, the fatality, the fatalities from fossil fuel pollution. Um, there's a nine-year-old soccer player, Carter V in British Columbia, healthy kid, had asthma. He woke up one morning and he was healthy. By the evening, he had died because of an asthma exasperation. Similar story about a decade ago in the UK, this girl, named nine, another nine-year-old named Ella had the same thing happen, but it wasn't due to wildfires there, it was more due to um, just smog and air pollution in her community. And she came from a more marginalized community as well. A lot of, when you, the poor areas of town, often they're the ones that live in the more polluted areas. If you have more money, you often live further away from the pollution. Water, waterborne diseases. Floodwaters, so flooding can happen. Floodwaters are often dirty and carry disease. Sewage backs up. Um, a lot of fecal matter in the floodwaters. This, hap this happened in New Orleans. This has happened in Pakistan, um, many different places where this kind of thing has happened and creates high levels of uh, waterborne disease. And um, also climate change, it causes wars and conflicts, creating refugees, refugee camps, 
ha often have significant sanitation problems. Diarrhea is the leading killer of children on, under the age of five, despite it being very easily treatable. We don't even think of kids dying of diarrhea in Canada, yet in some in many countries, it is an everyday occurrence. Even right now in war-torn areas in Gaza, a lot of the children right now are dying from diarrhea. Um, drought causes low water levels. Water is more important than oil and money. If you don't have water, well, you can't live. And this can create um, conflict as well. There's conflict right now, it's political, but between Canada and the US in, um, in the West, um, and between Mexico and the, the US on the Colorado River in the Southwest. There's tensions between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan over the Nile, and these can lead to conflict, war, forced migrations, and refugee crises. Deforestation forces humans to be closer with animals, increasing the um, possibility of zoonotic or animal to human transmission of disease. One of the probable sources of for COVID was from a wet market in Wuhan, China, where it was a zoonotic transmission. There is some controversy over that, but that's one possible source. Ebola, um, transferred over the species from bats and primates. Avian flu hasn't yet, but there's it's at very high risk of doing so. Vector-borne disease. Well, before this call, I was talking with Gordon and he had a tick uh, last week. So Lyme disease, dengue, malaria, shagas, they're all can cause disability or death. Changes in wildlife patterns and habitats um, caused by warming climate deforestation or, ha or habitat loss. So I grew up in Ottawa in the 1990s. There were no ticks or Lyme disease here, really. It wasn't an issue. Around 2010, public health was testing for ticks because it was uh, becoming a problem. Now they're so endemic that ticks are not tested. There's warning signs everywhere, and pharmacists can prescribe prophylactic antibiotics like doxycycline. Drought, fire, and extreme rains can cause crop failures, which can cause increases in prices, food insecurity, and inflation. Um, there's crop failures right now in the Horn of Africa, which is one of the reasons for conflict in the area. Um, there's crop failures in California, where we depend on for a lot of our food. It comes from there. Um, Alberta and British Columbia have really bad drought right now. And... Farmers out there are getting rid of heads of cattle. So that's having an economic issue, but that's also going to have a food scarcity issue. The cost of beef is going to go crazy high. So increased food prices, inflation, increased cost of living, increased poverty, people lose shelter, become homeless. These can cause, even all of these can generate negative health outcomes. It's a cascading effect. Non-communicable disease. So... As we degrade our ecological and social determinants of health, we're going to have higher exposure of metabolic disease and diabetes. Food scarcity is an example of that, um, where we're eating more empty calories. Uh, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, um, kidney disease, cancer. So climate change, as many people have been heard, it's a risk multiplier. Um, extreme events and or poverty, uh, reduce access to medical treatment, which makes non-communicable diseases even worse. So, and then there's the mental health side. There's eco-anxiety and climate grief. It's on the rise as people worry about their futures or they grieve, um, they grieve what they grew up with or what could have been. Um, as well, extreme events cause forced migrations and displacements. These can cause post-traumatic stress syndrome that can have lasting effects. Impacts on healthcare. Mentioned this already, but the 100, well, Northwest Territories had a forced evacuation. There was a 100-bed territorial hospital that got evacuated, including ICU patients, frail elderly, pregnant, dialysis patients. They had to go somewhere. They came south and they put 
um, the receiving communities into surge. This is a picture from California when there was a wildfire. Uh, I was at a presentation from a nurse down in California, and she was saying that there were burn marks on the side of her hospital. So imagine for those who are in Ottawa, imagine there's burn marks on the side of the general hospital or something like that. That's like unfathomable to me. So as mentioned, our healthcare is already under stress, but climate, the climate crisis is going to put it under tremendous stress in the future. So there's an extreme nursing shortage. There's family, do people don't have access to family doctors a lot of the time in Canada right now. Um, family doctors are quitting and changing specialties. We lack infrastructure and resources. We need to be going the opposite direction of this to cope with climate change. We need a really robust healthcare system that's strong. We need a healthy workforce to cope with the coming challenges. And we need to be working under capacity so that when a crisis arises, where our healthcare system is able to surge. Another interesting thing, Fort Chippewan, uh, Indigenous First Nation is downriver from most of the oil sands in Alberta. There's really high cancer rates in that community. The country food that they harvest, so or hunt, <clears throat> it's no longer edible. They're finding tumors in a lot of the animals and in the fish. That means they're having to buy their food, but food prices there are very high. It costs a lot of money to get it there. Therefore, it's a major food insecurity issue. That was terrible. So we have three options. We can either deny that it's happening, we can go into paralysis, or we can take action. So as Joan Baez says, action is the antidote to despair. Nurses are the most trusted profession, and I'm trying, as well as many of my colleagues, we're trying to use our voice because our we're interested, our vested interest is human health. It's not about finances. We care about human health and that's why we're so trusted. So I'm chairing the Ontario Nurses for the Environment. It's an interest group of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. I'm working on a few campaigns. Um, we're working on a sustainable or net zero procurement campaign with the Canadian Coalition of Green Healthcare as well as Canadian Association for Physicians for the Environment and the Canadian Associations of Nurses for the Environment. Um, RNAO has 51,000 members and I represented them at COP28 in Dubai. We have numerous events and webinars that kind of are at the intersection of environment and nursing. We write a lot of submissions or we help RNAO write a lot of submissions on government legislation. And then we're working with many partners on their campaigns. One of the campaigns that's getting a lot of notice right now is the Fossil Fuel Ads Make a Sick campaign. So this is uh, taking a book from the anti-tobacco campaigns of the 1980s. So where we're trying to ban fossil fuel ads in Canada. And if we can ban the misinformation, then we can start putting in the regulations to really make a difference with climate change. So on February 6th, NDP member of Parliament Charlie Angus introduced Bill C-372. Uh, and behind him, he has a doctor, a nurse, somebody representing the nurses. And I believe the last person there is a pharmacist, so I'm not sure. Um, in Ottawa, on March 5th, there is a motion to ban uh, fossil fuel ads on City of Ottawa facilities. And unfortunately, I was working, but I had a, another nurse, uh, Una Ferguson, go and she presented on behalf of RNAO at uh, committee. So this is from a Lancet article. Um, it shows where a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions come from in healthcare. Healthcare is not clean. Um, many of you probably have seen a Ventolin inhaler or metered dose inhaler. They have a uh, fluorocarbon propellant in them. 100 doses from a MDI is equivalent to driving 290 kilometers in a car. And that's because the fluorocarbon is such a potent uh, it's such a potent greenhouse gas. So globally, healthcare accounts for 5.2% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And in Canada, it's 4.6%. Um, this is this diagram on the right that's from the National Health Service in the UK. But 
about two thirds of those admissions are from uh, the supply chain, medications and medical equipment. One of the things I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get uh, sustainable procurement happening in Canada, and I'm working with a bunch of collaborators on this. Sustainable procurement is where 80 to 90 percent of the cost, well, when you're procuring equipment, 80, 80 to 90 percent of the procurement weighting is on cost, and then 10 to 20 percent is on sustainability criteria. This already exists in the NHS in England. Hamilton, Hamilton Health Sciences Center has started this. Uh, Government of Canada Treasury Board has a green procurement initiative over things that are over 25 million. White House has something similar. The challenge in healthcare is we have a very decentralized system with 13 different health jurisdictions. And in Ontario, it's even more convoluted with numerous institutions. So currently we're in talks with Accreditation Canada and uh, the health, um, health Standards Organization to see if we can get this implemented in a standard and then institutions across Canada would want to opt in and we could become a large market force where we can push for uh, greener products and therefore force manufacturers to make better things. When I do a dressing change in the community, a single dressing change is filling a garbage can for me, a small little garbage can, but that big, I'm making about this much waste every time I do a dressing change. And I'm doing about eight of those per day. The amount, and that's in the community where the waste is low. If you go to a surgery, a single surgery is filling about three large garbage cans or more. Some other low hanging fruit are anesthetic gases. There are fluorocarbons. And if we got rid of them, we could dramatically reduce some of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions in healthcare. And there are alternatives. There's intravenous anesthetics that are possible. So there's work being done on that front. Another thing that I'm trying to get done, just like uh, there's labeling on cigarettes and tobacco, there's labeling, nutrition labeling on food, and then there's other labeling on drugs. We could get a carbon equivalent footprint on, uh, on healthcare supplies and medical products. This could, you could even go beyond that. You could put it on all consumer goods. There'd be some political pushback against that, but it's possible. Um, if you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure. So often we're not measuring what we're, the impact of what we're buying. But if we start measuring it and you go to the store, you wanna buy healthy food for you. Well, a lot of people wanna buy something that's environmentally friendly as well. But if you don't have a means of comparing, it's very hard. So it could help with the procurement. There's some challenges with scaling it, but I've been in talks with Health Canada and some collaborators on putting this in place. It's a long way away, but it's something that I've been working on and um, been. I made some of these connections when I was in Dubai at COP28. So that was one of the advantages of going to that. Um, when I was in, when I was at COP28, we were finding that internationally, not just in Canada, but internationally, a lot of healthcare curriculum, so entry to practice for nursing, entry to practice for uh, medicine, they don't contain anything talking about climate and health. There's no competencies on it. What I just showed you briefly there, there's no discussion and elaboration on that, or very little. And we have to find a way of getting that into our curriculum so that nurses and doctors can have that voice and use that voice. So this is from meeting Gordon and his wife, Carmen. I started working with uh, Carmen and Algonquin College to try to get some of this into the Algonquin College curriculum. Um, a colleague of mine, we precepted some fourth year nursing students to investigate some of this stuff for their community uh, nursing placement. I, we've I've, I had the honor of talking at Algonquin College. Um, we've also been had some of my colleagues talk at University of Toronto and we're starting a community of practice Google group. It's still in its infancy, but to talk with a bunch of different uh, institutions to try to share what one group is doing and what another group is doing to hopefully collaboratively come up with um, greener 
uh, curriculum and greener practices within healthcare, uh, healthcare education. And then I went to Dubai. There's some pictures, um, but um, well, let's do them very briefly. And then we'll get to question and answer. So I flew through Zurich and ironically, though I was going to a desert, is it opening there? Um, there were delays in Zurich because of a snowstorm, which is kind of ironic. COP is this weird thing. There was 100,000 people there and you come across, but you you get really close exposure to different people. Um, through these closed doors, I saw uh, Antonio Guterres, who's the Secretary General of the UN. Stephen Gilbo, I went to a presentation at the Canadian Pavilion and I was able to speak with him and some other Assistant Deputy Ministers from Health Canada. This person is uh, Dr. Maria Nevera. She's head of the WHO's Climate and Health Department. It was in UAE and they were having like their national day. So this is on my walk, on my commute there. You know, it's kind of cool. The lineups in the metro were crazy and jam-packed. This is another picture of how jam-packed it was. It took two hours to get from the metro station into the venue because the lineups were so slow. Another talk. This is me talking to Stephen Gilbo and talking about that fossil fuel ads make a sick campaign. There's also a whole lot of misinformation there. So the climate talks, they were led by a oil executive, an oil CEO from UAE. Canada had its share of misinformation going on there. Saskatchewan put a lot of money. They had a pavilion. Um, I do some first aid on the side and for the red, with Red Cross and I was sitting on a couch one day and I sat down beside the Secretary General of the Red Cross. So that was kind of a cool picture. It kind of shows it's pay for access going to these events because you have to pay so much to get there and take such a long time to get in. But once you're in, you have, there's a tremendous amount of collaboration that's possible because people become more accessible. Picture from the plenary room, picture from one of the discussions. This was a stunt that we did. Um, it was me and a bunch of medical students and some doctors. It was called the climate code. So in the hospital, when somebody has no pulse, um, not breathing, they're unresponsive, you start doing CPR on them and it's called a code blue. We did a code climate right in front of the plenary room and we made it onto Reuters and AP, and we brought a lot of attention to the health side of the climate crisis. That was another reason that I was there, was to bring our voice there. Uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, we walked, we then brought that globe around and we took pictures with many different people. So this here is the president of the Seychelles. I'm there and there's a couple of doctors that are with me more of the misinformation that happened in the metro station. Oh, this is the WHO pavilion here. Has some lungs to show the, uh, some symbolism. That's another uh, uh, stunt, some of the artwork. This here was an interesting presentation. Scott Moe of Saskatchewan was there. And there were three oil executives and CEOs and, and an executive there, and they were all on Canada party badges. So there are all they were all official government um, guests that were at COP. There's Danielle Smith, also talking in a very canned event. It was interesting though. It was the size of Disneyland. It was a huge, huge venue. Everybody there walking around got blood blisters on their feet pretty much. I it took me quite a while for the blood blisters to fully go away. That's the entrance. And then Dubai has lots of luxury. This is one of the private yachts parked at the side on the way to Abu Dhabi. I'm just gonna end it there.
and we can go into a discussion. So discussion, so the climate crisis is a health crisis. Action is the antidote to despair. I'm gonna pose a question for everybody. How can you take action to make the greatest impact? And we'll open it up. Well, thank you very much, Rob. We going down yet another rabbit hole as we see that our actions are having these uh, ripples that most of us weren't thinking about, you know, several years ago, and now they're around us. I want to make it a bit personal. Um, our group has a tendency to get a little overly academic. Um, I'm still tutoring young kids, so I need to make it personal and concrete. So if I was to talk to, uh, my question is, if I was to talk to my kids who are like around 30, around 30 and they have kids, I can say, what what do they need to do? What do they need to be aware of in terms of the climate impacts that are going to happen to them as things warm up and, you know, we have new diseases? So what's a practical advice so they can be ready for what's coming our way? I would say have a reserve aside. Keep some money. Make sure that you can... Make sure that you are not living paycheck to paycheck as much as possible, but be ready for something to hit and to be able to adapt to it. You need to have resilience ready for that. Um, so as a adaptation point of view and a personal point of view, um, well, you can mitigate all of your emissions as best as possible. It's never going to be perfect, but being ready to deal with the punches because there's going to be punches that'll come. And mm. the most effective type of climate action is group climate action, where you're really pushing for political things. I can I bike a lot. My Twitter handle is Nurse Rob on a bike. I try to mitigate that as much as I can, my personal greenhouse gas emissions, but compared to the scale of things, they're but a drop in the bucket. We need large scale changes where we work together to change how our society works. Does that answer your question, Gordon? Yep, that's a, that's a good one. I just need something direct, simple, sweet. Um, our first question <laughs> is going to be from Paul Beckwith, and on deck is Richard. So, Paul, first, Richard, you're on deck. Yes, uh, great presentation. I learned an awful lot. So. About the wet bulb temperatures, like 35 Celsius um, is the, the theoretical wet bulb temperature is derived from body core temperature being 37, losing some heat towards the extremities, so 35. But but uh, the, but very, well, most people are more like uh, 31 or 30, 32 degrees Celsius wet bulb, and then they have all the symptoms, um, you know, heat stroke leading to heat, exha heat exhaustion, leading to heat stroke, et cetera. And, the very young and very old are even more, more vulnerable. So are you aware of any of the technologies? Uh, there are some technologies out there, like I call them chill suits. You know, India has a, bat a rechargeable battery powered suit, which uh, current goes to these uh, devices called thermoelectric coolers. And it can actually cool your body, pull heat from your body. So you can work outside on construction, for example, when wet bulbs are exceeded. There's also the idea of water-cooled suits. We can talk about the extremity of, are we, maybe we'll have to wear astronaut suits to live on this planet soon uh, with the way things are going. So are you, uh, maybe I, you can comment on um, if the medical in, um, industry, medical people are aware of some of these uh, technologies uh, existing and uh, yeah, thanks. I'm gonna take that, but kind of move it in a slightly different direction. If you look at the people who are doing this outdoor work, the people who are doing this outdoor work, often they're lower income, more marginalized, some often racialized. When I was in um, Dubai, they do a lot of construction there because they're building and building and building. And they're pulling a lot, like the population there there's 11% which are citizens and the rest are all foreign workers. 
and there's not a lot of human rights in place. There's a lot of indentured work around the world, and honestly, the people don't people who are in power who have this construction stuff going, like who are doing a lot of the building. Some of them care, but a lot of them, I would say, probably don't. They would not. They're paying as low wage possible for this labor. They don't want to pay for this low wage waiver labor, plus pay for technology for that. Um. I don't think in some cases the value of a life for some people, they don't care. Right. But if you have a construction project that you want to be uh, accomplished and you either have it done at night in a place like Dubai where it's cooler or you provide some sort of cooling mechanism for your workers so they can be productive and efficient. Right. So it's in the company's interest that they would deploy some technologies with their workers to allow them to work under these uh, wet bulb conditions. I'm not aware of exact technologies like that. If somebody were to come into the ER, they would put, uh, they would put them with intravenous, uh, cooled intravenous fluids to cool them down. Um, but as for those exact those kind of technologies, there probably are some cheap hacks that you could do, as well as more expensive ones. Um, a lot of, there's the construction workers. I'm worried about a lot of the frail elderly people who are lonely and stuck in apartments without air conditioning. I'm really concerned about them as well. And simply getting a cold towel with cold water on it, things like that. These really low tech solutions are ways that you can cope with it. Yeah, I mean, the best thing a person can do um, is just uh, go to a sink and run cold water over your wrists for a few minutes. That can cool your your entire body. Um, you know, if you're in a, in a situation like that apartment or whatever, people just need to be aware of some of these tricks to cool their body because that that's a very highly effective method. Um, or, you know, put your feet, stand in a bucket of cold water is another, another possibility. There's a lot of variations like that. There's special cooling chairs as well where they put their arms submerged. There's a whole bunch of different things like that. Great, well, thank you. Hopefully uh, uh, that to Paul, that he has answered your question. Um, we now have Richard with a question and Art is on deck. Okay, thanks. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, Richard. Okay, Rob, it's good to put a face to a name. And, and... Uh, by the way, Richard and Art are doing this amazing project to make the, trying to make the Civic Hospital more, uh, um, well, get rid of the gas plant there and try to make it more, mitigate their emissions there. They're doing a lot of work there. So he, great job there as well. Well, th thank you for your support on it too. And uh, um, you were one of the signers <laughs> of the letter we sent. And uh, there, there are a couple of things actually. Um, I wanted you. You did refer a lot, like you, uh, to some of the contributions um, healthcare institutions make to climate change. However, a couple things: Vancouver General, uh, they have actually adopted not giving putting any plastic in the environment. In other words, even when the residents go and buy their meals and so forth. Nothing is packaged at night. If they're going to go and buy something in the middle of the night when they're on call, there's nothing that comes in plastic. And, and they've gotten rid of as much plastic as they possibly can. And as you well know, a lot of the medical products come packaged in plastic. And this is something where I think the Ottawa Hospital could have a major impact in saying, we don't want anything wrapped in plastic. And I think that could be something you and your colleagues could really push for, saying get rid of the, the plastic. Second thing, um, yes, uh, we are trying to push for getting rid of the gas plant and uh, diesel backup and, and making the Ottawa Hospital go green. I think I wanted you to expand a little bit. I'm going to step back and let you answer. But the contribution of healthcare institutions to uh, climate change in terms of their uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption uh, in terms of their energy sources. So I'm just going to go to this. Huh. 
Okay. So this is one of the best studies that came out in the Lancet here. Yeah. And if you look here, supply chain, uh, yeah. two thirds of it. Um, building energy is that yeah. small portion of it there. Anesthetic okay. gases and MDIs are probably yeah, yeah. about half of that building there. Uh, fleet and business travel, patient travel, just travel in general, and then uh, commissioned health services there. So um, if you look up Dr. Miles Sargent, he did a really interesting paper on low-hanging fruit. with, And yeah. he has a peach tree with low-hanging fruit and has all these different places. Um, there's been a huge focus on make, on making buildings and infrastructure um, more green. But Absolutely. that's a small piece of the pie. And I'm looking here at the supply chain and medications there. And that's two thirds. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot yeah. bigger. And that's why I'm going after that two thirds of the pie instead of that, you know, sliver. So oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm really going after that. And with that plastics pollution piece, if you go yeah. after, where is it? Uh, sustainable procurement, and you include that in the sustainability cr criteria there. Yeah. So you have greenhouse gas emissions in there. You could have zero waste, et cetera, and put that yeah. into the sustainability criteria and put that, implement that in a standards policy. Yeah. That is one place you could do it. Ottawa Hospital is one place, but you need a, Ottawa Hospital is a big place. Hamilton Health Sciences is big, but compared to the whole country, it's a small market share. Compared to international, it's an even smaller market share. So I think it's great to go after the auto hospital where you can. Yeah. I want to go and change it at the accreditation level. So we have a larger market share doing that. Oh, for sure. I'm trying to, I'm in Oakville currently um, because my mother's in hospital here. And yeah. there it's solar panels on top of the, the roof here in at the uh, Oakville Trafalgar all solar powered and, and not only are they going to have less emissions, um, they are going to save over $7 million over 20 years. Yep. Um, and I'm trying to find out uh, whether they need any diesel backup at all. Okay, that'd be um, The Ottawa hospital claims it needs it. And we are skeptical of that. And we also think you might be able to bypass that. So I ain't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> keep going keep fighting with the help of art and raymond we are pushing on this and uh we are long we are far from being done and we're also working now with the city of ottawa as well and if going back to here you see the mdis there the yep. small sliver by anesthetic gases and mdis when i was in glasgow at cop 20 uh cop 26 i was talking to the GlaxoSmith Klein rep gsk yep. Yeah. And they did a carbon audit on their selves and they were saying that 50% of their, uh, of their corporate greenhouse gas emissions were coming for their MDI production. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. So you got to target, target and focus and know who your real enemy here is. And so, yeah, good job. Thank you very much, Richard, because you're obviously uh, in the medical field as well. So that's very helpful for the rest of us. Thank you. Um, our you. next question is coming from Art and Anitra, you're on deck. But Anitra, please keep your microphone off until you start asking. Thanks. Art, you're on. Did we lose Art? Yes, we did. So, okay, Anitra, you're now on. You can throw your mic on Anitra, and John Hollins is on deck. Why don't we do art after Anitra if she, if, yeah, he if, if he on. if he reappears? Okay. If he reappears, John, you'll be after art. If he doesn't reappear, such is life. Thank you, Rob, for, for a most interesting presentation. Uh, my question is, you gave us so many different things that you would correct or that you find incorrect. What do you think are the top three effects of climate change 
on Canadian health that could begin to be worked on right away, but the top three. I think, well, there's, there's a few ways to deal with that. Biggest impacts on our health, I would say the smoke coming, uh, the smoke from wildfires is probably wildfires, but also just pollution in general. So it would be great to stop those fires. But we also have to come up with ways of adapting and living with the smoke. So we need solutions to deal with this, the smoke. There were like uh, operating rooms that were being closed because their ventilation systems relied on outdoor air and they couldn't run when the smoke was at its worst. So we had to come up, we had to adapt to the smoke. Um, that's probably number one for all of Canada. Another one, Dr. Courtney Howard, she's been very involved. One of the things that she really wants done is to onshore our pharmaceutical industry. Because if when climate crises, when, when a climate event happens or a crisis happens, if there's a scarcity of various life-saving drugs and you don't have them, you don't have access, that's really important. That came to light with COVID. So we need to have access to that. Um, and then just general adapting and having resilience within our healthcare system to be able to surge. I think that we need to be able to, we really, climate change, unfortunately, we're 30, we missed the mark by 30 years. You know, we had, we should have been working on this 30 years ago and making it work instead of fighting over it. We're not. Now we have to adapt to it. Every 0.1 degree makes a huge difference. We're right now, there are some people that said 2023 was 1.48 degrees of warming. And look at how crazy 2023 already was with the fires and storms and all this other stuff. And that's at that. As this gets more, every 0.1 degree matters. We need to start mitigating things. So that for large systemic things, those would be where I would go for systemic. For you as a person, it would be different than that. You as a person, I would say, make some changes where you can and you can afford to. Have a backup system of a backup financial reserve so that you can cope with things. But then you really need to take action. So find something that you really like. So for Art and Richard, they really like doing this action on the Ottawa Hospital. So find something that you really like and that you have connection to and just run with it. Does that thank answer you. your question? Yes, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you very much. I really enjoyed the concreteness of that uh, question and the reality of the answer. Um, I bought, in terms of the smoke, uh, everybody in our family now has a very high-end Cadillac HEPA filter, which they can pull out for their bedrooms when there's a fire where they're, and we have family here and a cottage in Quebec where the fires came from and British Columbia, where if you're trapped between, uh, in BC, if you're trapped between the mountain ranges, it's worse because there's nowhere for the smoke to go, right? So uh, next is uh, John Hollins and uh, uh Art doesn't reappear. I do have his questions. I will pretend I'm as handsome as Art Hunter. Art's there. I see him. Is he back now? now? Okay, yeah. great. So uh, Art, that, and that if you're back, Art, you are first. Sorry, John. Art, Art is first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Uh, and, uh, and thank you, Rob. There's, uh, you know, when uh, uh, you say nothing can go wrong, well, it happened here. <laughs> I just lost. Total, total internet connection. Anyway, <laughs> the, the oh, um, things can go wrong. You just got to roll with the punches. <laughs> now, uh, one thing you're not aware of was back in July of 2019, uh, KCAR sat down and and uh, um, our memberships came together and and we wrote a a plan to survive which tried to address the many dimensions of what what one 
can do to to prepare for for when the the grid goes down and the the pandemic is running and they all all the worst case things that you can imagine are happening with um, storms and what have you. Now, um, now that we've got you and got you in this frame of thinking, uh, what are the three things that you think should go into this preparation for this catastrophic event that's that's going to have a major impact on your on your life at least in uh, the one to three months time frame. What would you put in your kit? So I was taught. I went to a few presentations with some emergency response type people, and some of the nurses. There was a nurse um, from California, the one who uh, that picture the ICU patient with the flames behind. She's had to be evacuated a few times from fires in California. And to her, she has a kind of like a bug out kit or kit, like a quick response mm -hmm. kit kind of thing. And um, things that she has in it, you know, birth certificates, passports, um, or- Yeah, I'm more really interested. Are. I'm more interested in- Well, in, this is important yeah. though. This is actually really important here because if you don't have those documents, getting them afterwards is really, really hard. Getting new ones is really, really hard. And people, they can be flooded out or they can have a wind storm and they can have an issue with that and they don't have their documents. Maybe there's some really important mementos from their child, from their kids, something like that. Those are really important so that you have it in a bag and ready to go. And it seems trivial, but it actually isn't if your house burns down. What what were you, what what did, where did you want to go with this art? Well, really, what I wanted to go, I've got a bug out kit. I've I've got all those things in it. Now, I am short on what I might have for my own personal health care. Should I be, you know, going to the pharmacy, for example, in advance and and making a plea for for uh, three months worth of my my medication and and put that in my bug out kit? Should I be looking at at uh, you know, uh, uh, dry socks or, or you know, from your perspective, what, what is it that from uh, a personal health care, how are you going to survive without uh, leaning on professionals to to help you survive? What should I have in my bug out kit? Well, I have two ways I'm going to answer that. You should have your medications. You should have your medications for a few weeks at least. The people that came down from uh, Yellowknife, they were down. They, they needed a few weeks of medications before they could find access to new ones. Um, that being said, there's a real need nowadays where we live in isolation from each other a lot. You really need social connection. Knowing your neighbors, knowing the people around you, where you can turn for help. And yeah, there's batteries as well. But it's being able to work together as a smaller community and a smaller area is very important. Um, it's a weird way of answering it. And it's not the answer you want. I know. I, I know you don't like this answer because you want like the, you know, a list of things. And there are, you can get a list of things. That's fine. But it's that social connection is so important. Knowing, you know, my neighbor's a nurse, my neighbor's a doctor, or, oh, my this neighbor there knows how they can fix anything. So when this goes down, I can fix it. Oh, this neighbor here has a really good garden and knows how to, you know, you know we can get some food together and grow some food together. These kind of things where we're working together and working as a community versus working as isolation individuals. There's a lot that needs to happen in there so that you can prepare and work together so somebody can have your back. Because ultimately, yes, you can go live as a hermit, you know, in a tent up in the north if the north hasn't burned down. But usually <laughs> we need to work with each other. 
And having those social connections and knowing your neighbor and knowing how to work with them is really important. And that's probably not the answer you want, but that's the answer I'm going to give you. I think that's a very good answer. And uh, the uh, having strength in communities has always been one of the, the banners which I carry that says, um, be part of your community, work with them now. So such that emergency time, this isn't meeting people for the first time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art. Um, we now have finally our wonderful bearded friend, John Hollins, who I'm very envious of your beard there, John. So <laughs> lucky you. Um, makes you look very, very wise. Uh, I'd like to look wise too. And um, <laughs> after John, there isn't a question. Uh, there's a bit of a comment about a prediction for the next year in terms of what we could be doing to be ready for something. And that's from Richard. So I'm going to let Richard comment after John. Go, Thank John. you, Gordon. The beard goes back more than 50 years. It was soon after we got to Canada. We went with my sister and a few months old son down to the United States in a station wagon with one tent. I slept in the station wagon. I didn't shave and I haven't shaved since. So that's the explanation for the beard. It got white somewhere along the way. I'm not quite sure. Um, look, um, uh, uh, Rob, thank you. Uh, there are two people on this Zoom who were at COP28. Um, uh, and I have a question that stems from my argumentative nature. Uh, and I want to just quote a theorem from cybernetics, the study of the control of systems. If what you're doing isn't working, tr do something else. Anything is better than what is not working. So what I, my question, I have two questions for you. What did COP28 actually achieve? And is it worth the citizens of the world continuing to go to COP or should we simply abandon them? Um, especially in my view, given the platform that it provides for, for the companies. fuel misinformation industry. I would say that COP, I went to COP26 first and I came back very energized and very invigorated and like I had meaning and I wanted to do something and I found that the nursing association was receptive to it. I had a very different feeling coming up from COP28. COP28 was this really big roller coaster of emotions. You're working crazy hours, well, volunteering crazy hours. <laughs> Um, and you're seeing so much misinformation and so much negativity happen and you have all these people there, but how come the fossil fuel companies have so much platform for everything? Hmm. And it took me, I came home and it took me about three to four weeks to recover from it. It was really, 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 really intensely hard. It was very cool but it was intensely hard. Um, Bill McKibben describes it as in a different one way. So he doesn't think that uh, these cops are amounting to so much change, but they're a really good barometer of where the change is happening and the degree of change that is happening. Are we moving the needle forward, backward? Where is that needle? And that's one benefit to it is it exposes where the barometer is. Um, COP28 was interesting in that the fossil fuel companies previously were in the periphery, in the shadows. Here, they were wide out in the open. You saw them. You know, Sultan Al Jaber, he was leading the bloody thing. You know, it was disgusting in a lot of ways. It was like, you know, it was, you know, they're oil executives. I showed you pictures with the 
Saskatchewan, misinformation everywhere, and the oil executives there, and getting it. The interesting thing was, previously, they weren't there um, getting the platform. This time, they were getting the platform, but it was very obvious that there was misinformation going on. They were being exposed, which was interesting. Um, one benefit of it is the access issue. If I wanted to go and speak with uh, Assistant Deputy Minister for Health Canada, I'd send an email. I'd send another email. I'd send another email. Maybe a year later, I have a meeting. When I went there, it was paid for access, paid three, four thousand dollars from the uh, nursing association to go. Wow. I didn't pay for it, they did, but I pay my dues. Um, but they paid for me to go with the airfare and hotel and all that. So it's the actual event is free, but it is pay for access to go. But I go there and it took a year and a half application process, but there I am and I'm able to give my elevator pitch to the ADM from Health Canada right there. I'm able to give my elevator pitch to Stephen Gilbo. I'm able to have a talk or argue with Danielle Smith, sort of, you know, if I want to. I didn't because there's no point in that. But, <laughs> um, you know, there's an access issue thing. They obfuscate a lot of that access as much as they can, but it's much more, it's there. You're, if you have, if you have the means to go, you, you 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 know you can get access and there were people from africa there it was harder for the people from africa to go because they you know there's a lot of financial issues a lot of the time and but and definitely the north american and european countries were overrepresented in comparison but i met some uh nurses and doctors from africa there and they're getting platform there was a climate activist from uganda um and vanessa and she got a huge platform to speak. So it's creating this platform. For actual international agreements, I was so skeptical of the whole thing. I thought, okay, this is a waste of time. Uh, nothing is gonna come of this. What I'm doing on the outside and on my and my advocacy work and like the shaking hands with people in elevator speeches and meeting and talking with different people and collaborating, this is where I thought I had the most benefit there. Um, surprisingly, this was the first COP where they mentioned fossil fuels as the root cause of climate change expressly in the final document. It had never been expressed before, and here it was done. It got watered down slightly, but it was done for the first time. Whether that'll turn into action, who knows? But there's some benefit in that. Um, I had some friends who went to the OPEC pavilion because OPEC paid for a pavilion as well, which is ironic. And they met with the secretary general there who was trying to talk with people and he ended up just leaving in a huff because there was, he, people had, he had no answers. Um, but OPEC sent this very scared letter um, a few days before the end to all the different OPEC countries telling them to block this agreement that was coming out. So they were scared. It's, it mm -hmm. is interesting. It's not a, I can't say it was good, but I can say that it was interesting and some benefit came out of it. Is it worth it? I don't know, but it's a, it's a system we have. Thank you for that broad answer, uh, Rob. Um, global heating is a wicked problem in, 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 in our Pathways report. Uh, we were thinking mainly about the actual phenomenon of global warming and its consequences, but it's also a wicked problem in governance because it won't work unless enough rich countries uh, get on board. So I basically withdraw my cynicism and suggest that the cost that you and the other delegates incurred in money and emission of greenhouse gases is perhaps a worthwhile expenditure in the context of seeking what any possible way 
of moving in the right direction. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Rob. Um, I want, I'm thinking this to be our last comment. This is a comment from Richard. And uh, let's see what uh, you think it, about Richard's prediction here, Rob, and therefore what practical stance once that, you know, we as Canadians, mostly Canadians at least, should be doing. So there you go, Richard, shoot. So there are two things. One, in terms of practical suggestions, this year is predicted to be a very bad year for uh, fires. And um, one suggestion would be that everybody should have N95 masks because they do filter out smoke particles and it's worthwhile having those on hand. So when the, the fires break out, um, not everybody has uh, high efficiency filters because even they don't uh, necessarily uh, filter out all the small particles. But N95 masks would be one thing. The second thing is, I think we need to educate more and more the public on how much changes at a personal level can have on a on everybody's health. Because I hear more and more cynicism. People think it's pointless. There's no point in changing anything because, oh, their, their own contribution won't make any difference. And uh, I think... This should be one of KCOR's missions is to uh, educate Joe Public, write more editorials, uh, whether it be in the Globe or whether, I mean, Globe, uh, well, some of us have had not had a great success rate at getting things into the Globe, um, but then into the Hill Times, for instance. What does it, what difference does it make when people at an individual level make changes, whether it be uh, using an EV whether it be switching to heat pumps, et cetera, et cetera. We all know it. So I think that has to be uh, really important to, for Joe Public to understand that, that it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they feel hopeless. It's totally in, in Joe Public. And the more I talk to people, the more I hear people feel it's totally hopeless. What difference does it make if I change anything? So I'm going to just do something here. Yeah. So we have three options. You can deny that it's happening. You can be paralysis, go into paralysis and say, I can't do anything, or you can take action. And action is the antidote to despair. Um, any action that you can take is good. Couldn't agree more. Um, well said. Individual action, it might be a drop in the bucket, but even if it's an action and it's avoiding despair, it's worth it. We need public policy to change to enable that individual action. We need access, we need better um, active transportation infrastructure. I can, I love biking around. Not everybody feels safe biking around. How do we make it accessible to everybody? How can it be safe for small children and seniors to safely bike around? How can a mom or dad safely get their child to daycare in, in any small town or major city? You know, these are all ways we can act. So me biking this morning to have to meet with somebody versus driving, it's negligible. You know, I think oh my Strava said it was like what was it Just like 1.8 kilograms of carbon dioxide saved or two or whatever compared to many megatons it's nothing but that small action it's something tangible that I can do and it's also showing that it's possible to do it it's showing others that it's possible and then getting the public policy in place so that everybody can do it that's important you know making it so you know, we have high quality public transit system, you know, so our LRT in Ottawa is not like a crapshoot, you know, it has to be high quality that people want to take and it doesn't go just 11 kilometers, but it goes from way out in Orleans to way out in Canada and it's almost as efficient as taking the 417, you know, things like that. So people want to do it, but it's also our public policy 
has to be enabling individual action because one individual action is minimal, but everybody's individual actions, super positioning or superimposed, like, you know, like it adds up. And that's where the big changes happen. Well, what we're going to remember is action. And I'm now going to act to uh, bring this to wonderful presentation to an end. I'm a believer that shorter is better, and it's been definitely better. Um, I think my my reflection or what I'm going to take away from your talk, Rob, is that the the state we put in our mental health. You didn't talk about mental health, but as you know, my oh, my yeah. wife is obsessed with that slightly. You know, when when we have keep our mental health sound, we have a chance of having the emotional reserve. And you talked about having the, the reserve to deal with things when we get hit and not, you know, giving up, falling on our face and giving up. So the, the action is, you know, whatever the result, I think what you're also inferring is that it's good for us. It's good for our health. We may not save the world, but we may save ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's a good thing. I'm all for saving agree. myself, right? That's, that's <laughs> good. Um, we're going also to with up. that, Gordon, when yeah. you're biking from one point A to point B, not only are you reducing emissions, it's also good for your health. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it's good for yeah. your mental health. Feels Absolutely. Good. Yeah, it all ties in together. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for all the excellent questions. I'm going to let Jean now do the formal thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. That was a really interesting talk from the perspective of everything from what an individual can do through to how you can activate with the government. And, um, and you've certainly given this a perspective that not we've not often had at KCOR, especially when we start looking at the health crisis. We're only now starting to become aware of, of the health crisis that's associated with. So I'd like to thank you very much for bringing this perspective to our attention. And so thank you for that. Um, and it is my, my pleasure to give this thank. Uh, as the uh, past chairman of the organization, I'm very grateful that he came to give this presentation to us. And for those of you who are listening online or listening to this later, I would strongly, I would ask that you go to our website, canadiancore.com, to find out more information about us as an organization. If you would like to join us, um, you are more than welcome to do so. If you would like to uh, get more information about some of our other talks and videos that are online on our YouTube, you can go on to the Stay Informed page, sign up for that, and you will get all of an access to all of the videos that we've had, including this one today, when it goes up online later on this evening or tomorrow morning. So I'd like to ask that you go to CanadianCore.com, find out more information about us. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing more of you in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day.